Good morning, St. Mary's. As we come to the end of March, it is a joy to invite you into this space, however you are coming into this space. The few of us that are able to be in here this morning, those of you who are gathering with us live, those of you who are picking this service up at a later time, we're just grateful that you've made us a part of your week and a part of your Sunday. Thank you so very, very much for doing so. It was one year ago, approximately today, that I remember logging on to Facebook and joining in like six or seven different groups of clergy people who were trying to figure out how in the world we were going to navigate this pandemic together. And I remember, and I will never forget this, this will always be my first thought of Unitarian Universalists, God bless them. I remember one Unitarian minister saying, we've already said that we are done for the entirety of 2020. We are not gathering. This was in March. He said, our congregation has decided we just, we understand, we're just, it's not going to happen this year because they can see what's coming. I remember laughing. <laughs> I say, look, I am all about being proactive. That feels even a little too proactive for me. Well, it goes to show what kind of a prophet I am. <clears throat> because here we are a year later, still finding ourselves where we were a year ago, having to gather in new spaces. I remember having a conversation with Rob and saying, you know what, three weeks, that was the rule, right? Three, 21 days to stop the spread. And we said, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to do our part. We're a member of this community. We want to make sure folks are healthy. 21 days has turned into what feels like a lifetime. And so today, as we observe a year that we've been apart from one another, and yet finding new ways to connect with one another, today we'd like to take a little bit of time and to memorialize that, to think about it, to process it in the context of faith. And our service is set up to do exactly that. And I'm going to give you a little hint on the sermon already. There's not going to be a lot of answers. There's not a lot of lessons because we are still learning them. There's still so much to play out. But that doesn't mean there isn't work that we can do, faithful work to worship, to reflect, to meditate, to confess, to hope, all the things that we do as the people of God. We can apply all those skills to this year to reflect, maybe not to land on answers, but to renew our hope that God is still with us, among us, and leading us. And so that's what we'll be talking about today, and we invite you into that space to do that work with us and to see where God leads us through the course of this day. And so friends, I invite you, as I often invite in on daily prayer, it's early in the morning, I invite you to fill up your lungs with some good oxygen, breathe out sort of the carbon dioxide of last night and whatever it is you've been doing. Invite yourself to bring your fully body, mind, and spirit into this space wherever you are and ready yourselves to worship.
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In this fifth Sunday of Lent, please join me in the call to worship. From the comfort of our homes, we gather to worship. Whether through painted word or through the gift of technology, we are a community joined together by love. Here we seek connection to the divine. Come, let us work, whose ways are known to us in the cross of Christ. Let us join in our first hymn, We Gather Together. Friends, we're used to the idea of confession being a deeply personal act where we confess our sins to God and God offers forgiveness back to us. And all of this is, of course, right and true. But confession is also a communal act. The scriptures say, confess your sins one to another. The suggestion being that it is work that we share together. And indeed, it's work that we participate in together as we discern what we do as a community, much of which is praiseworthy, some of which calls for confession And often it is difficult to discern our actions, which is which. And so today as we reflect on a year, we come to confession, not because we are prepared for God to judge us, but rather that the God revealed to us in the pages of Scripture is welcoming and inclusive. And he draws us to himself and directs us to love one another. And we still seek to remove all the barriers that keep us from love of God and neighbor, that we might know God's abundant life. And so come now, let us confess all that separates us from others and from God. Let us pray. Holy One, we long to be faithful stewards of your abundant grace, to serve each other in love and humility, to serve your world with wisdom and energy. Forgive us when our words and actions are not guided by love. Turn our hearts when we act in folly. Restore our energy when it is gone. Sometimes, many times, O God, our efforts fail. But your abundant grace is strong and eternal, and forgiveness is ours through Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. And friends, when we are in the in-between of not sure, did we do something excellent? Did we do something that needs confession? When we are not sure, let us be reminded that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so may the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, 
Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring us together to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, come to our assistance. Lord, make haste to help us. Let us join in the prayer of the day. Loving God, your desire is for our wholeness and well-being. We hold in tenderness and prayer the collective suffering of our world at this time. We grieve precious lives lost and vulnerable lives threatened. We ache for ourselves and our neighbors, standing before an uncertain future. We pray, may love, not fear, go viral. Inspire our leaders to discern and choose wisely, aligned with the common good. Help us to keep practicing new and creative ways to come together in spirit and in solidarity. Call us to profound trust in your faithful presence, you, the God who does not abandon. The New Testament reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Who made you superior to others? Didn't God give you everything you have? Well then, how can you boast? as if what you have were not a gift. Do you already have everything you need? Are you already rich? Have you become kings even though we are not? Well, I wish you really were kings so that we could be kings together with you. For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of human beings. For Christ's sake, we are fools, but you are wise in union with Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are despised, but you are honored. To this very moment, we go hungry and thirsty, we are clothed in rags. We are beaten. We wander from place to place. We wear ourselves out with hard work. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are assaulted, we answer back with kind words. We are no more than this world's garbage. We are scum of the earth to this very moment. I write this to you not because I want to make you feel ashamed, but to instruct you as my own dear children. For even if you have 10,000 guardians in your Christian life, you have only one Father. For in your life, in union with Christ Jesus, I have become your Father by bringing the good news to you. I beg you to follow my example. For this purpose, I am sending to you Timothy, who is my own dear and faithful son in the Christian life. He will remind you of the principles which I follow in the new life in union with Christ Jesus and which I teach in all the churches everywhere. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 121. Let us read responsively. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. 
The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And our gospel reading for this fifth Sunday of Lent comes to us from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. When they came to the crowd, a man came to him, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? Jesus said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Friends, much as much of what gets us through difficult times in the life of the church and our faith, of course, is the act of prayer, and the quintessential prayers of the church are found in the Psalms. I often wonder what it would be like if we could pick up David and the other writers of the Psalms, drop them in our modern times, and say, just write. How would you pray about this? You, who is described as having the very heart of God. We're not able to do that. But sometimes the arts, sometimes writing, sometimes poetry helps us to work our way through times that are challenging and difficult, for which often there is no explanation, and invites us back into the presence of God. And I was fortunate enough to find such a psalm written for a modern time. It's entitled, A Psalm of Lament and Praise in a Time of Coronavirus. It was written by a Methodist minister named Kenneth Howcroft, and we'd like to offer it to you today read by our own Alan Stiles. How shall we praise you, Lord our God? When we are locked down, how shall we praise you? When the doors to your house are barred and your people cannot assemble. When those who desperately in need of money and work cannot even wait in the marketplace. When we have to circle round people in the street and to queue for shops maintaining safe distance. When we can only communicate by hearing on the phone or seeing on the screen or digitally messaging or even just waving through a window. When we cannot meet our parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, or other family members and friends. When we cannot touch them in their flesh and blood to know they are really alive. How shall we praise you? How, like Thomas, shall we not see yet believe that your son is raised among us? How shall we praise you? How can I praise you, Lord? Are you plaguing us with this virus to punish us because we have all done wrong? 
or thought wrongly, or felt wrongly, or just been wrong? If so, why do only some die, and those apparently the ones who are least worst or most caring among us? Or are you trying to teach us a lesson? If so, why is it so hard to learn? And how are we to find the answer when we do not even know the question? Or are you still the same loving God, coming to us in our sufferings and open, opening up the way to new life in Jesus? Lord, I will try to praise you through gritted teeth. I will try to praise you. I will try to remember that you have created all things, and this virus is part of your creation. I will try not to hate it, but seek to mitigate its harm. I will try to keep myself and others safe. I will work to pray for them and seek to help in whatever way I can. Lord, when I cannot pray or worship, Help me be aware of all your people and your saints and angels hovering round me, lifting me up. When I feel alone, let me feel you near me, even if only for a moment that enables me to go on. Let me hear you say, Peace be with you. Lord, I will praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Some sermons are intended to be, for lack of a better term, a lecture. Let's learn something. Let's walk through the text together. Some sermons are fire and brimstone. You probably remember a couple of them. But I hope this morning is neither of those things. Because I want this morning, as we think about lament and praise, I hope that this morning is just a warm blanket something to make you feel a little more comfort, a little more warmth, and a little more connection. I sat myself down this week to reflect again, as we've been doing for the last 365 plus days, to reflect again on one year of being locked down, to do what was just described, to lament and to praise, to mourn and to hope, to ask questions that have no hope of an answer right now, and to seek answers nevertheless. And I spent some time doing that, just trying to think deeply about what all this has meant for me and my own vocational call, for us and my relationship to you as your pastor, and for you all as a congregation. And to try to think deeply about what it's going to mean for us, because I really want this morning to be a good word, something positive and uplifting at a time that can be unbearably weary and heavy. For while this is unprecedented, while there is none of us who remember living through a pandemic, I'm not yet entirely convinced that it is extraordinary. Challenges, major challenges, life-altering challenges are not new to you and to me or to us. And so I'm convinced that maybe we have some tools to make some of this make sense. Unexpected things happen, and in the midst of it, our faith asks us to consider what Alan had just read for us, that we still serve the same loving God who comes to us in our sufferings and opens us up, opens up the way, excuse me, to new life in Christ. And so if we believe in that God, and there are times it is difficult to believe in that God, but if we take that as a premise for this morning, I've come up with two answers for us today. The first answer, as we've reflected on this and thought about this, is that in many, many ways, it's actually too soon for us to make any sense of this. Friends, we still have to give ourselves the opportunity to feel ourselves the entire way through this and to give ourselves some time to get some distance. Because sometimes when things are right in front of us, we make decisions that are very, very difficult, that ultimately don't have the ends to which we hope. And so the first thing I want to give us today is permission to not have this sorted out. Our best guesses at deep, enduring lessons that will launch us into a new era of the church are just that, guesses at best. 
So maybe it's a good word for you this morning, that if you don't have it all figured out, if you haven't made sense of this, if God still, and God's place in all of this doesn't make sense, it's fine. We don't need to rush any of this. We simply need to honor where we are in the moment and trust that the Spirit will speak to us and will lead us when it is time. And where are we in this moment? Where do we find ourselves a year later? Well, here's what I see as one of the people that's allowed, allowed, who gets to come into the church just about every day. I noticed that Sunday school happened this morning. I noticed the bells were practicing this week. I keep noticing that you all, for whatever reason, keep showing up for prayer each and every morning. at 7 o'clock. Like, if we did church at 7, there would not be 20 people here. But somehow, online, you all keep showing up. Our neighbors are visited. We are gathered here as best we are able. Things roll on. Which brings me to the other thing I want to say this morning, which is quite simply this. We're going to be all right. And in this way, I'm reminded of the words, those very famous words of Julian of Norwich, who said famously, perhaps you'll recite them with me, all will be well, and all will be well, and all matter of things shall be well. Christ Church has endured many things before. This particular locale of Christ Church has endured many things. And we shall endure this as well in due time. And so our work of praying, loving, and supporting one another through all of this pandemic continues. At this point, two things can be true at once. We can have entirely and complete faith in God, and we can still have concerns for what the future will be. We can know that it's going to work out okay and still feel urgency to move things forward. So what shall we do when so much of the work we yearn to do is beyond our control? When we so badly want to fix this, we so badly want to get back to normal, and yet there are still so many things that are beyond our control, our ability to manipulate. What do we do with this sense of helpless waiting still? We'll enter one helpless father. The father we read about this morning who comes completely helpless, one might imagine, his emotions inside coming apart as he shares with Jesus and tells him a story. He said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He's falling into fire and he's falling into water. And I brought him to your disciples. I did what you keep telling me to do. I brought him to the people who are supposed to be able to help me with this. But they could not heal him. If we read this passage with thee, they could not help him. I don't think we understand the tenor and tone of this. This is a father whose son is falling into fire and cannot find help. While the situation between what we're experiencing right now and this father are very, very different, the sense of our entire reality being changed by a physical malady And the helplessness and the inability to manipulate one situation to a more positive end rings with particular clarity for me in this moment. Jesus, out of a heart of compassion, and yet nevertheless expressing frustration as his disciples, which Jesus is wont to do, says, you faithless and perverse generation. A more modern translation, maybe, because those words ring a little harsh in our ears. I'm not sure they're quite as harsh as maybe we hear them. It's more, you all have no sense of God. You have no focus to your life. The issue of Jesus' frustration, let us be clear, is not this man and his concern. It's not the son. He is not the one lacking faith. The issue is the disciples. And what is it the disciples try to do? The disciples who have been following Jesus around, who have seen Jesus, who have seen Jesus use extraordinary power to extraordinary ends and want to be like him, so they try to do it themselves. They try to fix the problem by healing this kid. They're like, well, if Jesus can do it, and we're Jesus' favorite, right? We should be able to fix the kid. And they failed to do so. They just wanted to exercise some kind of control and some kind of influence on this to make all this go away, to figure this situation out for this guy, and they couldn't do it because we can't manipulate our way 
to these things. We can't force these issues of faith. They're not working out of faith. They're working out of a context of power. Can we just make it what we want it to be? And the answer is no, they can't. But Jesus does. Jesus can. Jesus is powerful enough to move this man's son from sickness to health. And so the disciples are flabbergasted by this. So like if Jesus could, like, we don't, we don't understand what, why this happened. And so they go to Jesus as is appropriate for the disciples of Jesus, including you and me, to, to do. To go to Jesus and say, why can't we do this? And maybe our questions are similar. Why is it that we're still separate? Why is it this pandemic is still here? Again, the question that was asked, you know, is this some kind of punishment? Why can't, we want to give you answers back, but we don't understand the question, what is being asked of the church in the pandemic? It's okay to go to Jesus and say, we don't get this at all. The disciples are like, what just happened? Why couldn't we figure this out? And Jesus' call is cutting and clear. If we're looking for clarity, here's the clarity in Jesus' response. He says, because you have so little faith. I'm not aiming this at us. Just saying, Jesus said, this is an issue of faith. And there are some manuscripts, if we go way, way back, it's not printed in most of our Bibles, but there are manuscripts that we have that say at the end of this verse, because in many of your Bibles, there are no verse 21. Well, verse 21 in some manuscripts says, because Jesus says this kind, this kind of malady, this kind of issue, only comes out by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. The disciples discerned it as one kind of thing, something that could be manipulated and fixed. And Jesus says, no, 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 this is a spiritual issue going on here. So we have these two tools. Jesus is like, here's how you do it, prayer and fasting. But if we aren't careful, we can talk ourselves into some kind of notion that there's this magic formula to fixing all the challenges of our life. If we just pray harder, if we just fast more, if we just give more, whatever, if we just do enough, we can make this all work. No, 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 slow down. Prayer and fasting aren't means to manipulate God. Prayer and fasting are means of connecting more closely with God. The way forward is not to do. The way forward is to be in relationship. How so? Fasting, as it's practiced in Lent and it's practiced throughout the year, fasting is intended not to show just how much we're willing to punish ourselves. Fasting is about clearing out the distractions, clearing out excess so that we can focus and we can hear clearly. This is why we can fast all kinds of things. We can fast food. We can fast television. We can fast, we can, we can, we can fast all sorts of things because it's about clearing out distractions so that we have a clear gaze. Nobody needs to explain to us how we have fasted for the last year. But there is a clarity in it. What will emerge out of that, I'm not yet sure, but there is a clarity to our fasting. And second, prayer is not by which we go to God and tell God what we think God ought to do. Prayer opens us up to hear the voice of God. Prayer is not about changing God's mind. Prayer is about us expanding our imaginations for what God can do in the world. Fasting and prayer invites us to draw near to God, not to fix the problem. You say, well, what do those prayers sound like? How would Israel Israel have prayed? Well, if we began earlier with a psalm, perhaps we might end this, this morning with a psalm. The Israelites and the faith tradition of Jesus would have prayed in some in this way. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Now, here's the funny thing. When we read that verse, I lift my eyes up to the mountains, many of us see the Appalachians or the Rockies or some of you have been to Europe and you see the beautiful mountains that are out there and we're like, oh, how beautiful. That is not how Israel read that. Israel read that. I lift my eyes up to the mountains because it was on the mountaintops where the idols of other religions were often built and hid, where incantations and dances and sacrifices were made to get the attention of God. Do all the right things and God will sort it all out. Israel looks up at those idols and say, those people know where to go. Where will we go for our help? Where does my help come from? Psalmist takes a deep breath, exhales, 
and says, it comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord, the one who will not let our foot slip, the one who is not slumbering or sleeping. God has not been asleep for the last year. God has been calling us towards God's self. God watches over us. God keeps us from harm. He watches over our coming and our going. That's the prayer that draws us to God. That's the prayer, the faith that Jesus talks about that will move mountains, maybe a little bit at a time, but will move mountains. In this pandemic, friends, we, friends, we've never, not once, escaped God's gaze. And while the whole world seeks to bend all of this pandemic to their own will to make stuff happen, the follower of Christ, in patience and in trust, believes that God will do the work. And so it is to this work in what I believe are the final days of this pandemic. Friends, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope that very, very soon we're going to be able to be back together. Vaccines are happening. People are starting to, you know, that's happening. You know, numbers are starting to fluctuate a little bit, and we know that things are up and down, but there is a sense of coming back to a new normal. It's there. And so let us end these final days well. Not by trying to make things happen necessarily but to prayer and to fasting, to the faith that moves mountains. Because this pandemic's not going to last forever, but God's faithfulness will. And so in these last days, I will remind you again, my brothers and sisters, it will take us time to figure it out. That's okay. We don't have to know all the lessons yet. God will teach us. God will show us what God has been up to for, the, for an entire year and how God is launching us into the future that he has planned for us. And finally and most importantly, my dear friends, it's going to be okay. Not because we'll figure it out, but because God is always present. And as the scriptures tell us, he will never leave us and never forsake us. The Lord will watch over our coming and our going from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. And so we're going to invite you to turn into your bulletin. And um, I, don't, I, didn't, I, I didn't run this past Mary Ann. All right, but uh, this is a hymn I'm not sure of. Maybe you all know this one, but this one's a new one for me. But it speaks to this moment, and I'm excited about learning this hymn for the first time. A hymn entitled, Out of the Depths.
Let us join in the confession of faith, sharing the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, we take that energy and turn the energy of God's ever-present love and turn it, aim it, point it at our loved ones who have requested our prayers. And so we have a couple of updates from our prayer list this week. We'll begin with John Cunningham, um, the brother of Belinda Finn, who has been hospitalized with multiple issues. And so we pray, uh, not brother, uncle, forgive me, Uncle John, um, and we lift him up and ask God's blessings. We pray um, for Ellen, who is struggling with kidney cancer. We pray for our sister, uh, Bonnie Kramer, who uh, went, uh, underwent surgery on Monday. Um, I heard back from her yesterday, continues to do well, is making progress, um, but still remains hospitalized, and we lift her up also. We pray for Judith Kuhn, who is, uh, in, who is struggling under the weight of bone and lung cancer, both in stage four. We pray for Gloria Wright, who is struggling with health concerns. And finally, we pray for our sister, Heather Kinnamon. And so with those prayer requests, we're going to do a slightly different uh, way of prayer this morning. Um, we've crafted a prayer that, that really speaks to and invites us to pray for the entirety of COVID, how it's playing out in our community and in our nation. And so we'll be doing, um, I'll read through it, um, and then we'll invite you to respond at various times. Lord, hear our prayer. And so let us pray. God, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love. Your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you. When we ignore your invitation or desert you for gods of our own making, even then you do not abandon us, but reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. As you welcome us, so you welcome our prayers. We bring them to you with confidence, knowing that you will hear and that you will answer. And so we pray for the world you created and the people who share it with us, for countries caught up in war or violent conflict, for regions of the world struggling with increased cases of COVID, for those whose homes and lives are threatened by natural disaster, for these and all the other areas in our world where there is need and despair, we pray Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and for its people, for our government leaders, federal and local, for our judicial system, police forces and military, for our cities, towns and rural communities, for employers and employees, for young and old, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our local community, the people of our cities and towns, for those who are unemployed, for those in prison, for those who are hungry, for those who are alone and afraid, for all our neighbors we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, our brothers and sisters in Christ, for those who are ill or whose loved ones are ill, for those who are anxious about the future, for those struggling with their faith, for those who minister among us, for those who are on our prayer list, specifically John Cunningham, Ellen, Bonnie Kramer, Judith Kuhn, Gloria Wright, and Heather Kinnamon. For all your people in this place, we pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our friends, for those we have lost at the hands of this virus, 
for those we have lost and could not and could not do more because of the virus, for those who long for connection to family and friends, for those uncertain about what the future holds, for all our traveling companions, known to us and unknown, we pray, Lord, hear our prayer. And so pour out your spirit on us, fix our hearts and minds on what is true and honorable and right. Give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful to the call we have received in Christ Jesus our Lord, extending your loving invitation to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And following in the way of our Savior and praying the words he taught us to pray, let us join together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we've continued to walk this past year, we've been reminded not only that we go together as a community of faith here at St. Mary's, but it's also useful to remember that we go as a collection of sister congregations, of other churches, of even indeed of other denominations, as together we walk as the body of Christ to serve God and to serve one another. Today is one of the opportunities we get to celebrate that and to give towards that. Today we're going to be inviting you all um, to participate in one of the four four wider church offerings of the United Church of Christ. Um, This one in particular is called One Great Hour of Sharing, which is dedicated to missions and ministry throughout the world. And so we have a very brief video to introduce uh, One Great Hour of Sharing to you to give you just a glimpse of how One Great Hour of Sharing has been working in the pandemic to support our neighbors throughout the world. And so we're going to show this to you. We hope uh, perhaps that you'll be able to find us, find some room to give towards that. And as soon as the video is over, we're going to come back and we will bless our offerings together. You can't hide love. It shows up where you least expect it, in places where food is scarce, in the rubble of a disaster's aftermath, where water is hard to come by, where home is a tent in a foreign land, in the middle of a pandemic. Love seeks us out. One great hour of sharing has sought to minister to people in need all over the world for more than 70 years. The work we have done behind the scenes responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, providing water to the thirsty, and empowering those who have been marginalized may not make headlines. But eventually, you just can't hide love. Join us in our pursuit to show God's love all over the world. Give to one great hour of sharing. And of course, we would be remiss in saying if we didn't, uh, it's okay to have a little pride every once in a while in church, right? That we very much pride ourselves on being a five for five church that we give towards these offerings um, with great regularity. Um, And so this is one of those offerings. So we invite you to be in prayer about how you might contribute to that, just as you are in prayer as to how you contribute to this place and the work that we do. And so however, um, however you decide to give, however we collectively um, decide to be in the world, we ball it all up, we collect it all, and we simply offer it up to God as a gift. And so let us bless that gift as together we pray. We have the means to give, we have the reason to give, and there are many waiting for us to give. God of grace, help us to live and give in your kingdom of love where there are no enemies, only brothers and sisters, and kindness is the air we breathe. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. And so, friends, now that we come to the end of the service, I invite you to reflect on where are you now? Did you feel the warm blanket? If so, that's great. I'm really excited about that. You're feeling confident and encouraged about what God is doing in the world. That's fabulous. Others of us are still going to struggle with this. What is going on? Why is this happening? Many of us still have deep and unsettled questions that we're wrestling with. And a lot of us are in both camps. Wherever we are, the first place that we can start is trusting and knowing that God is present with us, that God watches over our going out and our coming in. And the best way I know to describe that in words that are both poetic and beautiful are in the words of the hymn, Abide With Me. So friends, as we prepare to close out, let us sing. My friends, rest confident in this. God is at work in the universe. God works through human hands, but God was not made by human hands. God is a creative, sustaining, and transforming power, and we can trust God's power with our lives. God will sustain us whenever we take a stand on the side of love, whenever we take a stand for peace and justice, whenever we take a risk. Trust in God's power, for we are together held by that power. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Oh, goodness. I did not expect to be here as I was putting the service together. And by that, I mean, went through, picked out a bide with me. Okay, great. That's a great way to end the service. And if you were here and you were walking out the door, you would see just a hair of red in my eyes. That hit me just a little bit. Um, And so from your pastor to each and every one of you, I want you to know that you are missed that this place is indeed empty without you, even though our hearts are full as we gather as we are able. Um, It's one of the things that just will not translate on camera, um, but I hope and pray that you know how much each of you are loved today. A couple of announcements before we dismiss. Um, First of all, we want to honor our tech sponsorships, both from last week, and thank you very much for those who sponsored last week and your patience as we sort of went in a different direction with that, and our tech sponsorships for this week. And so we want to honor them both, beginning with uh, we honor the memory of Ruth Miller by Debbie and Jeff Miller, and indeed we honor her memory today. We also honor the memory of Bernard W. Zentgraf, who died on St. Patrick's Day, March 17, 1995, from the Driscoll and Loban families, and it's our blessing to honor him as well. Today we honor Julia Davis's 25th birthday by Ruth Davis, and we say happy birthday, Julia, and we pray that your 25th is full of joy. And finally, we honor the memory of Dorothy Ireland on her birthday, and that has been donated by Barbara Ireland. And we say thank you, and we honor Dorothy's memory as well. What a joy it is on these tech sponsorships to just go back and just be able to celebrate and to honor. Um, And so thank you for bringing uh, these memories and these celebrations into the life of the church in such a way that it benefits us being able to be together even though we must be apart. Two final announcements. First of all, there's a newsletter deadline, uh, which is noon tomorrow, Monday, um, March the 20th. No, tomorrow's not the 22nd. Yes, it is. What is today? Today is the 21st. Okay, forgive me. So yes, the newsletter deadline is tomorrow. Lisa, I promise I do my best I can. Um, And so please uh, have everything to Lisa so we can get that out. And then finally, you should have received some information either in your email inbox or perhaps, if the mail is working uh, quite well, um, received in your regular mailbox um, that we have put together, the WISE team has put together a series of programming that is going to be running from now through, uh, through May. Um, and so we've outlined a couple of listening sessions, a book study, and perhaps some other opportunities as opportunity arises. We'll have more to say about this next week, but we are going to be doing a WISE listening session, which is nothing more than an opportunity to come and safely um, share the story of how you have interacted with your own mental health and the mental health of your loved ones, and to share those stories. We'll be hosting one of those listening sessions via Zoom. We'll hold it virtually on March the 29th. And so please put that on your calendar. Um, We will be saying more about that next Sunday. We'll also be sending out a Zoom link to everyone who would like to be a part of that. But we're looking forward to just beginning this process of just hearing the stories that are there, listening to one another, caring for one another, um, and holding one another in prayer as we continue to discern what God is calling us to do in the context of mental health, both now post-pandemic and into the future. And so those are the announcements that we have for today. If there are other announcements I've forgotten, most assuredly somebody's going to drop them in the Facebook chat and uh, you can pick them up there. But friends, whatever your week looks like, whatever the rest of your day looks like, be sure that God goes with you and holds you close. Until we are able to be together again, peace and good, y'all.